Nick, your, uh, your colleague uh, Kings Mill Bond has told me for years that renewable energy will start by taking all of the growth. And over the, uh, the years, the percentage of global power generation or electricity demand growth has been increasing. And, and it looks like in the first half of 2025, it finally has taken all of the electricity demand growth. Is that, is that the case? Yes. So in the first half of the year, the growth in source in wind power and in solar power was large enough to exceed the growth in electricity demand. And this was really a moment we were kind of hoping for, looking forward to for quite a long time. Um, and we've actually released a new analysis on this that goes for from the first to the third quarter. So the first nine months of 2025. And this was still the case. And we also include a forecast to the end of the year for the whole of 2025. And we're still showing that fossil generation will likely not grow because wind and solar are growing fast enough to meet all of that new demand. So we are really now at this point where for the first time in a year where we don't have a big recession, like the COVID pandemic, like the 2008 financial crisis, that have caused demand falls. For the first time in a year where we have normal demand growth, we don't have an increase in fossil generation. And it's, it's really a paradigm shift from a world where demand growth always means fossil generation growth to a world where demand growth doesn't mean fossil generation growth. And it sounds pretty straightforward, but essentially 10 years ago, this didn't seem like a reality that would come around so quickly. Nick, is it fair to say, because we talk about, you know, peak oil demand coming by 2030. Is it now fair to say that we've hit peak fossil fuel power generation demand? I'd say the best peaks are definitely observed after you've crossed over them. So if you look back two, three years and you see the peak, then you can be a bit more confident. There is There are two different dynamics that are going on here. So on the one hand, clean power growth is now fast enough or is at the same level as demand growth. And we do think that with, with growing solar capacity deployment, with growing wind deployment, we will maintain or even increase this level of clean power growth. So from that perspective, we're, we're kind of covering all of that demand. The second question is, how fast will power demand actually grow? And this is a really, really difficult question that everyone's kind of sort of getting right sometimes, getting wrong other times. So demand has been growing a little bit faster after the pandemic than it has before. And one of the big reasons for that is not a negative um, demand for energy is exploding scenario. It's simply that we're electrifying a lot of other use cases in other sectors. So we're electrifying transport with EVs, we're electrifying heating with heat pumps, and they use electricity. Now, not all demand growth is created equal. And Demand growth from EVs outside of the power sector are actually a really positive sign because they're displacing fossil fuels in that sector. So it might mean that we get a few years where that clean power growth is, is kind of keeping pace with the growth in electricity demand. But at the same time, we are decarbonizing other sectors with that additional electricity that that's available. So hard to call a peak at this point. But we're certainly not in a world where we get these really large increases in fossil generation every single year. One of the uh, interesting uh, aspects of this trend is the fact that a lot of the stagnation has been driven by declines in major markets like China and India, that where I think the uh, fossil fuel modelers like OPEC, for example, expected very, very significant growth in fossil fuel demand and in fact, that's not what we're seeing at all. Yeah, that's exactly right. So especially this year, there have been two really surprising stories. So China, on the one hand, was maybe the slightly more anticipated one, because over the last two, three years, we've really seen a massive step up in the amount of clean power that's come online there. And that has now this year specifically has met all of the growth in electricity demand. Last year already met almost all of it, but it was an incredibly hot year that came after a very mild year. So we had this really big boom in demand. That was slightly different this year. Conditions are more similar to last year. So what's really shining through is structural demand growth. So from economic activity, for example. And solar power is growing so fast in China that together with wind and a decent increase in hydrogen generation, uh, 
yeah, we, we can really meet all of that additional electricity demand. So that meant actually we're going to see a fall in fossil generation in China this year. Um, India is a slightly more unexpected story. And in a slightly unfortunate way, I guess is also the story that will take slightly longer to properly develop. Uh, this year was just incredibly mild in India. So temperatures, especially over the from sort of May to August, were much, much lower than they were last year, which led to a reduction in uh, electricity demand for cooling. So less people turning their AC on for less of the time. And that means slower demand growth, incredibly strong additions in solar and wind power at the same time as well. So in a normal year, this would have still led to a fossil generation increase. But because the power deployment for clean, from clean power was so strong, we're seeing a big fall in fossil generation there as well. Uh, and and completely unprecedented as well in a in a year that doesn't have a recession. But we're likely to see a few more years of fossil generation increases in India as clean power deployment ramps up to the same levels that we've now seen in China. But it's certainly, I mean, a far cry from the stories that that suggest just everlasting fossil growth in both China and India. Nick, um, a few months ago, I interviewed an Indian economist, and we were talking about the prospect of of LNG displacing coal in the Indian power sector. And she said that you'd really have to have, to be compete with coal, you'd have to have LNG at about, uh, you know, $5.50 a, a million BTUs, which is, I mean, it's at eight or nine or 10 at the moment. And the chances of going down to five and a half dollars are, are really uh, not very good. So that means that really only leaves coal in India. And it sounds like that the uh, renewables, uh, particularly solar and batteries, uh, really can compete against uh, coal in the Indian market. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, those power prices, the sort of $5 uh, on the LNG side, that's competing with domestic US gas prices, which some are uh, some of the lowest um, lowest there are. Um, and in, in fact, the US this year had a sort of price spike in the gas domestically, and that affects the global market as well. And we all kind of remember the 2022 energy crisis that sent energy bills, not just in Europe, but also in South Korea and in Japan through the roof. Uh, my expectation is very much that India will try to avoid putting themselves into a position where they're directly tied to the global energy market in a way that, that really led to not just issues within the power system or the energy system, but sort of like large scale civil um, civil unnerving um, because of the, the cost of living crisis that resulted of it. So there's so many good reasons to not attach yourself to a, a global LNG market. And certainly uh, in India already has other alternatives like solar, like storage that are price competitive, even with domestic coal. Uh, Nick, there's there's a, a a trend here that is really poorly understood in North America, uh, because the the assumption is that uh, North American LNG can help decarbonize, uh, you know, emerging economy power sectors, or that that uh, as population grows, you know, uh, in ice cars will will the number of ice cars will increase as well, and that will mean more oil imports. But if you're looking at it from the importer's point of view, and you raise this issue, is those are very high costs, and they have to spend uh, precious foreign currency reserves to pay for it. And there has been a, a move in the last year or two for company or countries like Malaysia to have explicit fossil fuel or oil and gas anyway import substitution policies. They would rather burn coal to create electricity and electrify their demand side of their economy, then keep paying for those really uh, expensive oil and gas imports. Are you seeing that trend grow? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the prime example is the European Union. Um, they were kind of shocked into this policy almost by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which then led to uh, ballooning of energy prices. Uh, the EU tried to get away from importing Russian gas and Russian oil and looked for A, other markets, but B, also reduced their import reliance through faster electrification, faster switching to um, to wind and solar power. And so that that's kind of the, 
the the biggest example of an economy of nearly 500 million people moving basically in lockstep, uh, switching within a few years. I mean, looking back, it can always seem like a really long time, but the, the energy crisis only happened in 2022 and it changed policy basically irreversibly. We're seeing the same in, in Asia already as well. So India has had a very strong drive to not only rid themselves of sort of imports of fossil fuels, but their domestic policies are also facilitating this. So they've brought some of solar manufacturing back uh, to the, into the domestic market. They've done that through some rules that were inhibiting imports from China, but then also some very clear rules on which solar panels could be used in domestic power projects and how they how they get reimbursed. So they've basically tried to onshore some of that critical energy infrastructure. And it certainly hasn't been an onshoring of more and more fossil fuels, but um, they've, they've looked to electrotech as, um, as kind of the, the solution here. And there's a really telling piece of piece of analysis that my colleague Ewan Graham did recently on the exports of these different electrotech technologies like EVs, batteries, solar, and he he looked at what is being exported from China and the value of Chinese electrotech imports has now overtaken the value of US fossil exports. So the writing really is on the wall of which of those two driving forces in the global economy is taking the lead. Uh, Nick, uh, thank you very much for your insights. Welcome. Thanks for having me.